jail and when you're incarcerated, it's a very good thing to have. There is a huge question mark over whether or not contractors are entitled to that status. And it's partly because they may be, in fact, taking direct part in hostilities. And a good example of this is most of the people who operate these really cool Star Wars unmanned aerial, unmanned aerial vehicles, which you might have seen on TV, are contractors. Because it's somebody who's sitting in a base basically with a joystick, like they're playing Nintendo, driving the UAV around. Those people are contractors. That is a direct part in hostilities. It's hard to see how it is. So does someone like that get POW status or not? And the other, my other um, lawyer baiting for the afternoon is that the lawyers can't agree about that. There's a big discussion about it. And that is also another example of why international humanitarian law is not a good source of regulation. If the lawyers can't agree about it, then we have a problem. It's not clear. We need to make it more clear. There are significant problems with international law, just as there are with domestic law. And the first one is that treating mercenaries and private security companies in exactly the same way, which is the current method in international law, particularly through the United Nations um, Sixth Committee, which is the group which devises international law, is taking. There are a lot of problems with that. And the analogy I like to use here is it's like we're treating drug dealers and pharmaceutical companies under the same set of laws. So you have a bunch of guys whose job it is basically to be criminals. And they're individuals, and they're doing things which we know to be illegal. Conducting a coup and going around assassinating people, we all understand that to be illegal. And then we have people who are providing a service which we may not necessarily like, and we may not necessarily like the way they do it all the time, but it's an important service. Those people want to be regulated. They're the pharmaceutical companies of the world. Do we really need to be regulating these two things exactly the same way? The other thing is, is that the more we focus on private security companies, the more we forget about the very real problems which are currently being caused by mercenaries elsewhere around the world. And one of the things that I'll talk about in the talk tonight is our international law on mercenaries is actually so bad on its own that we can't use it to deal with mercenaries. So what we need is to split our focus and we need to deal with the mercenary problem in one basket and the private security company problem in another basket. The difficulty with this is that the UN has this working group on mercenaries which has refused to change their name and because they call themselves the working group on mercenaries, private security companies hate them and won't talk to them because if you say the word mercenary near somebody who runs a private security company, they get very angry. Changes in international humanitarian law are unlikely, partly because the International Committee of the Red Cross seems to be convinced that it's working quite nicely in Iraq. Um, I would take issue with that assessment, but nonetheless, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to see the kind of change and clarification which I mentioned I thought was necessary. Changing the mercenary law is also going to be unlikely, partly because it took nearly uh, took nearly nine years to create the original convention dealing with mercenaries for a number of complicated reasons. It's likely to take that long to get any change, and it's likely to take even longer if we continue dealing with these two issues together, private security companies and mercenaries. The last type of regulation, and in some senses this is the most interesting because most people don't take this form of regulation very seriously, is informal regulation. And that's the idea that there are lots of things, lots of little tools that we can use to control this industry, which don't have the status of formal law, but can nonetheless be quite effective. On their own, they're totally useless. I'm not going to stand up here and say hey, this is an adequate way to regulate the private security industry on its own. In combination with other instruments, they're really useful. The first one is just reputational pressures and the market. The idea is that if you're a private security company and you do something bad, no one will want to hire you again. So simply put, your reputation is everything. You're not going to behave badly. So we can rely on the market. On its own, that's probably not good enough. But it, you, we can see how we can devise some schemes that might make reputation even more important. Civil suits, I've already mentioned, are one example. One suggestion which has been made is that a private security company must be forced to register in a state where it operates. So if you're going to operate in Iraq, you have to register in Iraq, which would thereby open you up to being sued by Iraqis in Iraq. There's collective self-regulation. There are two trade organizations for private security companies. The International Peace Operations Association, which is a lovely vague name, is an American organization, and the British Association of Private Security Companies. And the stated objective of these two groups is to create regulation and to create an industry-based code of conduct which says this is the things that we will do, these are the things we will not do. 
The problem with this is it's leaving the foxes in charge of the chicken coop. We have to trust that these guys are going to do a good job of regulating themselves. And in some cases, I think they probably would. In some cases, I think there's no doubt that they wouldn't. So leaving self-regulation on its own is not a great idea. The other great thing about these companies is they all hate each other to the point that some of them refuse to come be in the same room as some of the other ones. And that means that there was a huge debate when the British Association of Private Security Companies started, which was about a year ago, as to whether or not they would take in certain naughty companies as members. Well, if you don't have a universal trade organization, it's not a very good way to set up a code of conduct because there are going to be people sitting on the outside. And it's reliant on the continued goodwill of the industry. One of the ways, one of the really interesting ways that this system of self-regulation could be improved is by what I call enabling legislation. And the way you see this in the UK is the Bar Council, which governs barristers, um, and the laws governing solicitors, and the Medical Council governing doctors, those are self-regulating organizations. But they're self-regulation backed up by domestic legislation. So if you're a doctor and you break the rules, it's the doctors who come and tell you you've broken the rules. But it has firm legal consequences. You get kicked out. You can be disbarred as a lawyer. All of these examples, these are ways that we allow an industry to regulate itself, but we give that regulation some teeth. And that might be a really good way of closing some of the gaps down in informal regulation and making it a bit more serious. So all of these webs of regulation that I've been talking about with their overlapping strands, something to consider is the private security industry may never be as well regulated as the cheese industry. And that's because it's not the cheese industry. It's a lot more complicated. It's hard to think of in other industries which are as complicated as this one in terms of their political sensitivity, in terms of the damage they can cause, and in terms of their international operation. It's very difficult to think of an industry which is similar. So the best solution, we can either throw up our hands and say it's too difficult to regulate, or we can say, will enhance regulation at every possible level, that we're never going to be able to devise a perfect regulatory scheme. But what we might be able to do is come up with lots of ways to improve what we already have so that it works. Enhance regulation at every level. But there are a lot of implications here which are worth thinking about. And one of the whole points of having a regulatory conversation is, for example, we need to start asking questions like, how much privatization is too much? Are we really comfortable with the idea that military interrogation is provided by private contractors? Are we really comfortable with the fact that bodyguarding duties, which used to be given to regular soldiers, are now given to contractors? Also, you might have noticed something that was entirely absent in my discussion was a discussion of the ethical implications of this type of force. And it's something that I've worked on extensively in other things that I've done. And there's a criminologist at the University of Oxford, Lucia Zedner, who looks at the domestic private security industry. So she looks at security guards in malls. And one of the things that she says that domestic regulation dealing with security guards in malls have done is meant that the state is now the pimp's is now the industry's pimp. It's not the industry's regulator. So what the state has done is gone in and made it easier for private security companies domestically to sell their services, not more difficult. And the, the necessary ethical conversation, shouldn't some of this be the job of the state, hasn't happened. There are also issues of duplication, which I sort of hinted at earlier. If we came up with a better scheme, if we make contractors part of the Uniform Code of Military Justice in the US, if we make them subject to courts martial, aren't we really just doing what we've already done in terms of the national military? National militaries have a pretty good system of bringing wrongdoers to justice. So we could just use that, or we could create a whole separate organization for an industry that we're not even sure how much it costs anyway. So that's something else which is worth considering. There are significant implications that private security companies bring up for both the planning and the fighting of wars. This is a huge, huge change. We have not seen this degree of private force on the battlefield since the 19th century. And it undermines a whole number of our expectations, both about the laws of war and how they should apply, and also about how you go about fighting war, how you mobilize, who's allowed to do what on the battlefield. And one of the things that a regulatory conversation ought to do is cause us to think very carefully about these changes in war and what they mean. Finally, we need to think about the challenges that this is posing to international law, both in terms of international humanitarian law, which may no longer match the realities of war, and also some of the difficulties of international lawmaking, which have certainly been a particular problem in dealing with this industry. So that, that takes me to the end of what I wanted to talk about today, and I'd be really happy to take questions if we have some time. Sure.